Hello， 大家好，我现在所在的位置啊是 Nvidia 在台北的总部啊。我今天正好来这边参加一个技术会议，然后等一下来给大家展示一下今天要说的一些技术细节。And that is made possible because we have、uh, ray tracing inside this game engine. Everybody thinks that Unreal is a place where you do a lot of stuff for games, but it has a growing fan base for designers and architects. In fact, this scene was designed by Leo Chao, who is an architect here in Taiwan. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys、uh, how having ray tracing in your scene. Can really help you as an artist or a designer or an architect figure out the best kind of composition for your space. So let's go ahead and drag a couch in here, and I'm going to go ahead and drag another one in because I plan on having more guests. Notice how the light darkens. It gets darker because less light can pass through the couch. Again, this is made possible because of ray tracing. Now I'm going to make things a little warmer and put in a nice little rug here, and I'm going to add a table. I have a room full of very rich, dark、um, furniture, and so it looks too dark, doesn't it? So let's go ahead and lighten it up. I'm going to go ahead and add in a lamp. Now this is really cool. Since we have real-time shadows, we can see exactly how the light affects our our scene.、Um, so you can see the reflections change on the table and on the couches as I move. So let's go ahead and add just a little bit more to this scene to make it pop. I'm gonna add some baubles to this table, and here you can see、um, we have a few chrome balls, which are kind of cool. I'm gonna zoom in on here and show you guys. Because we have real-time ray tracing, we can see the reflections of our plant and our lamp inside this ball, which is really cool.、Um, I think it's cool. Um, so another really cool thing about Unreal is that you can also add in animated animation. So let's go ahead and just finish put some finishing touches and add an animated metronome. So something cool about ray tracing is that you have dynamic shadows and reflections even with animated assets because everything is real time being calculated. So here you'll see me move the light and you'll see that the shadows are changing. And I really want to show off like how cool this is. And I'm going to go ahead and adjust the light. So in real life, a light might have sharper shadows, right? Than、uh, than your sky. So you're getting this nice sharp look for your shadows、um, that you would actually get from a light. And now when I move the light around, you can really see how it affects these assets. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and also turn it so you guys can get an idea of how light composition is really important in interior and architecture design. So that is a little bit about ray tracing inside of Unreal and how you can design a space that looks like you could actually touch it right here on RTX 5000. Do any of you guys have questions? All right, okay. awesome. great. Glad you guys got it. So um, now that we've gone through that, if you want to follow us to the back, we can show you some other really cool demos showing you guys what our laptops can do. So now we're inside the studio suite and we saw what you can do inside of Unreal. But all of those furniture pieces, all of those couches, they have to come from somewhere. And they're typically built in a program like this. This is called Maya. And we're looking at a character built in at NVIDIA called Soul. So we're visualizing him inside of um, inside of Arnold. And up until recently, Arnold has been a CPU only based renderer. So with CPU only, Rendering can be a little bit time consuming. As you can see, the first pass is a little bit faster, but then it takes a really long time to resolve the noise in the scene. This is the bane of every 3D artist's existence who has to render because you can't do anything about it. If you're working on something and you need to deliver something, you can't deliver something noisy, so you're just stuck waiting. So when I'm working on a CPU renderer, I actually would use something like region rendering to help me. So I can draw a small section so that that is the only part getting calculated so I can get to that final frame faster and see things smoother. Now the problem with this is if I change a lot, I lose context of my scene. So I don't know if my hands got lost, if things got blown out, and so I'm making a gamble on how the final product is going to look. So that is what CPU rendering is like. And on a Mac, that's all you can do in Arnold is CPU rendering. But with GPU rendering, you could do a lot more. So let me go ahead and jump over here to the Gigabyte Aero. Now this guy has an RTX 2080 in it, eight gigabytes of memory and uh, a whole entire GPU unit that can be dedicated to processing your light. So Arnold GPU is available for PCs today. And you can download it as public beta. And what's really cool about it is that it takes advantage of your GPUs to uh, clean up and to finish resolving your images within a fraction of the time as your CPU. So let me make another change so you guys can get an idea. You're gonna see that the image pops into clarity really, really fast. So what's happening here? Well, we have a few things going on. The first thing is that our GPUs are accelerating how fast the lights get traced because you have more processing power and you have an RTX card helping to trace the light. The next thing is that we are using optics denoising to help us get on the fly cleanup of all of our noise. So basically, I can make 100 changes to my scene within a fraction of the time. It's an amazing tool that allows me to be able to iterate on my designs and create new assets. So another thing I'm going to point in, point out, point out here is the detail. A lot of people think that the denoiser blurs and defocuses, kind of like a beauty filter. But that's not the case. Since it's an AI, it actually understands what details need to be kept and what details don't. And it works in tandem with the actual render underneath to produce a cleaner image. So that is Arnold rendering inside of Maya. Here we're using one application on uh, GeForce 2080. Do you guys have any questions? No? Yep. Nothing? Yep. All right. <laughs> Let's move over here. So uh, you guys saw what I do in Maya in one application, but the truth is I usually use multiple applications to work. Um, so here we're looking at uh, three different applications. On the left corner where you see all the animations, that is Maya, and below that is Photoshop. And to the right is Substance Painter. I'm gonna show you how I actually use all three of these applications interchangeably to make my final design. 
So I have animation playback right now because I want to make sure my characters look good in the scene, that the light works well. And the first thing you'll notice off the bat is this character over here, she's a little too blue, wouldn't you agree? Kind of blends in too much. So I want to go ahead and think about changing her suit and make some alterations. Another thing I noticed is her shoulder is really bare and it's up there in the front. So maybe I'll add a logo or a decal to it. So I can go ahead and do that inside of uh, Photoshop here. And um, all I have to do is just paint something cool. And there we go, let's do that. And then I can bring it into Substance Painter. Substance Painter is an application that allows me to realistically visualize my materials. So let's go ahead and make the suit red. I think red would be a nice color with blue, right? Um, I like to work in parts before I commit to something. So let's just start with the arm. So now I can go ahead and paint the decal I made in Photoshop onto the model and painter. And when I'm ready, I can go ahead and transfer this directly to Maya. So now we have what we did in this application inside of Maya. So as you can see, I actually need multiple applications in or open at the same time in order to get my work done effectively. So now a little bit of tech spec here. Um, these applications are heavy applications because they are creator applications. They need to do a lot of stuff. And that means that they take up a significant amount of GPU memory. So if you look down here, we're using about 14.7 out of 16 gigabytes of the RTX 5000 GPU memory. For artists, we need to have multiple applications open in order to get our work done. So if we want a fluid experience, having more GPU memory can really help us because we, we don't have to worry about closing or managing our apps when we're working in between them. This is invaluable. So I can of course take all of these assets and have this exact scene with all of these files open on that gigabyte over there. But the problem is, is that with only eight gigabytes of GPU memory on it, um, we would see some throttling. So a good example is this playback is playing back at real time, but on the eight gigabyte uh, uh, graphics card, you would see a significant slowdown down to eight frames, nine frames per second. And when you draw inside of Photoshop, it would not be very nice. Same with actually like painting or drawing inside of Painter, you would have like serious lag if you were to do that. So there's a lot of really cool things that you are enabled to do when you have more GPU memory on your side. Do you guys have any questions? No? Again? Wow, you guys are an easy crew. Maybe you uh, can make her to the air model. What do you want me to do? Yeah, maybe you can change it all the all to the red. And to red? Yes, maybe look yeah. like uh, the air man. Yeah, we can uh, make her all red here. I have all the masks ready. Let me just grab that, grab this. Grab this. I think I got everything, right? And then we can go ahead and just update that into the scene. And it's going to update. And did I click the button? I did. And it updates inside of Maya. And then now we can actually play that back if we wanted to. So she looks pretty good. Yeah. Right? Ah, I have a logo over there. That's okay. And then, you know, when I'm ready, I can just go ahead and hit play. See that playback in real time. So really cool stuff. Very powerful. Yeah, pretty cool stuff, right? <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, that's that. <laughs> If you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask me. Um, but Doug is going to go ahead and take you away on a journey of working with video footage with these laptops. So right behind me here is Doug. Um, do you guys want to record? Uh, I'm wondering the, the real-time rendering will dramatically uh, be a very uh, help you work effectively. Yes. So how how many efficiency will you gain for you in work? So, so today um, we have interactive rendering in 3D, right? Yep. Um, so uh, let me just quickly select this camera because it's looking a little, his legs are blue, sorry, <laughs> it's waiting out. Um, okay, so in 3D we only have interact, like inside of Maya we have interactive rendering, real-time rendering is still getting there. Um, I get to work in Unreal and it's amazing. Having the ability to have real-time rendering and ray tracing for a 3D artist is a big deal. Because yeah. basically, I'm, you know, a huge, a huge bottleneck for us is waiting for 
uh, for rendering. Yeah, you for, have to try an error. Yeah, for the right. There's 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 a there's some really big bottlenecks, especially yeah. in three D. And mm -hmm. you know they usually they usually revolve a lot around rendering. They also revolve a lot around um, animation, right? So here we have we're seeing full uh, cache playback of animation. Um, and in Maya 2019, there's the ability to cache all of that animation onto your GPU, which allows us to see it in real time. Um, before Maya 2019, you had to right click and export out a video play blast and then watch it. So it was time consuming too. So GPU really helped with a lot of things. And honestly, with all of these new features coming out, like all of these applications starting to support more GPU stuff, I have more options and more speed on my side that allow me to actually make more changes. So I've been a lot more creative lately just because I can actually do more. Yeah. And what's really nice is um, I can take my work home now. So uh, I used to not be able to, I'd be stuck at a workstation. So, you know, when I left work, I couldn't work unless I remoted in and that's a little painful. Um, with the laptop, it's been really great. I've actually been using it for a few weeks and I've really been enjoying using these laptops because I can do all of my work and just take it with me when I'm done. I'm just like, oh, let's go home and take it. You know, I don't have to be like, let me transfer all my files. It's crazy. So it's been really, really nice. Yeah, you just not only speed up your, your work and also inspire more uh, idea in creation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's not just about speed. Speed affords you more time to create and yeah. that's that's really huge. And then on top of that, when you have mobility and flexibility, mm -hmm. yeah. you can go other places and, and get inspiration from other places as well. Work with new team members and things yeah. like that and think of things in a different way than you would before. Yeah. It's really cool. Yes, yeah, sir. Cool. Yeah. So I've, it's been really fun to work with these things. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anytime. You. So Doug's going to take you away now. Um, yeah. Nice to meet you all. Um, so my name is Doug Mendez. I work with Ashley and, and Jason on you know, these demos and showing ways that creators can get the most out of our RTX GPUs. Um, this first demo is an example of desktop class uh, video editing performance on a mobile form factor. So we talked a lot about you know, the RTX 5000 series GPUs, but you know the studio program also applies to RTX 2060 models as well. So in this case, we're doing a 4K video editing workload where I'm working in Premiere Pro and I'm able to do 4K editing. It's very, very responsive. Do, uh, apply multiple GPU effects in my timeline and play it back in full resolution um, and see my effects before I even transcode out. Um, I can do this all on a 2060 class uh, GPU. So this idea that we are enabling creators uh, across price points and SKUs and so on. So that's kind of like our litmus test or in the initial test of um, the capabilities. So let's go ahead and transition over to uh, 6K RED video editing. Um, so RED is a type of camera that is very, very high resolution. They um, can record a 4K, 5K, 6K, or 8K. Um, the problem is, is that when you're dealing with very, very high resolution video that is raw, meaning you have full color information, full color gamut, is that the amount of data to process is very, very high. Um, in this case, 6K video uh, processing is multiple gigabytes per second of video processing. Now you see what happens when we play this video back, we try to decode um, on the CPU or on a leading notebook PC, um, it will play for a few frames and then has to pause and play for a few frames. The problem is, is that this video decode process is much too uh, difficult for a CPU to handle. Um, and in this case, it's just not able to play back at full resolution. What you would do as a, as a video producer is you'd wind up having to transcode your video uh, to a, a higher compression or uh, work in another type of proxy. So reduce your video resolution when you're playing it back in order to really handle this. Additionally, it's impacting my system um, responsiveness. So if I want to like be able to scrub in the timeline and so on while I'm doing this video editing, you can see that it's lagging quite a bit behind um, by scrubbing even when I'm doing so slowly. It's just not a very usable um, file right now. Well, we worked with RED in order to GPU accelerate video decode. So now with an RTX 2080 based laptop, 
you can decode 6K video at full resolution at 30 FPS indefinitely. Um, this will really accelerate the workflow for uh, video editing professionals as they can now take their videos straight from their camera, put it into a reader and um, instantly be able to view their videos in full resolution. Um, they can do their like different color grading work uh, very quickly on the go and uh, without in, any missed time. That might be a little bit too much. <laughs> um, while they're video editing. And um, once again, like to see the impact on system responsiveness, you can see how quickly it responds to my inputs because of the fact that the system itself is not bogged down. The CPU is not processing the video as, as heavily and you're relying on GPU decode instead. Um, also like uh, when looking at this is playing it, back, playing it backwards. One of the also the freedoms that you get uh, with uh, raw video um, is that you're able to uh, do this type of thing. Um, this was completely impossible uh, on anything but a very high-end dual Xeon workstation before. Um, but now you can do it on the go with a thin and light PC. Any questions about this one? No? Would you mind to put this one on the same thing? Sure. erase if you will. You want to just like have it here like this static or play that's back? Play, that's play. play it there. Color? So color. So this is a, a type of video playback where it plays every single frame. It doesn't skip frames. So that's why you see this one overtaking and continuing and playing faster, whereas this one stops. Yeah. Um, in other types of video decode processes, what it will do is we'll, we'll just drop the frames, but the timeline will continue moving. So this gives you an idea of like the performance or acceleration that's a, a occurring where you are able to continue in your uh, video playback versus this one you have to stop. To this, uh, you also see an example of um, you know parts of the studio SKUs or recommendations where um, this laptop has a 4K OLED display, um, which is helpful in these types of workloads where you have high resolution video that you want to be able to experience at a near native resolution. Okay, want to uh, continue? So uh, now we'll look into some AI acceleration. Um, Workflows. This example is a DaVinci Resolve 16 Beta, and they've incorporated three new features that are utilizing our tensor cores or our AI cores within our GPU. Um, one is called Speed Warp, and it's doing frame interpolation in order to generate new frames in order to smooth playback. Um, the second is what they call face refinement, um, where we'll actually use uh, GPU to analyze the scene for facial features and then do corrections in real time. And the last one is object removal, where we can uh, take elements out of a shot uh, post and do that without masking um, you know, individual frames, but use AI to recognize objects. Um, so starting with the first one, we have a scene here, like a, a sci-fi scene, and in this case, uh, you know, we have a pivotal moment in our narrative where we have um, some space trash that's coming by. And it's going to be a, a big moment, a very important moment, but the problem is, is that it's too short for the audience. They won't, uh, they might turn away or blink their eyes and it will go by. They won't know that this happened, this very important moment. So as a video producer, what I might do is decide that I'll stretch this out. And I will make it in slow motion, and that way people are not going to miss this action. They get like, um, a feeling of excitement from what's happening here. The problem is is that because this was filmed at 30 frames per second or rendered at 30 frames per second, when I stretch it out, I now only have like six frames per second of data and that's why I'm getting this choppy feedback, right? We took, we took like a, a limited amount of frames and we stretched it over more period of time, right? So we can use AI to infer what the additional frames are. Um, in this case, we're taking that original frame, original frame, and we're using AI to decide 
based on the information here and the information here, what the frames between those would look like so that we can return it to a smoother playback result of like 30 FPS. So we'll have original frames and artificial frames that are generated. It quickly generated those new frames and now when we play back, we get a smooth slow motion effect by those uh, artificial frames. Now, it's not perfect. You can see that there's some artifacting and so on, but you're getting much closer to an end result that you can use for your production. And now we can use this scene um, and you know, users can really like uh, appreciate the, what's happening instead of missing the action. Um, the next one we'll look at is face refinement. Um, so in this case, we have a scene where she's showing empathy toward what's being uh, said to her. And um, unfortunately, the lighting was a bit harsher than they intended for the scene. What we can do is we can apply face refinement and tell the GPU to analyze this video. And what it's doing is uh, doing a video analysis or, or a computer vision analysis and generating a mask around the features of her face. It's able to recognize her eyes as eyes, recognize her lips as lips, and basically isolate those areas from the rest of the film so that when we apply our changes, it's only applied to specific elements. So I can make edits now um, to her face lighting and bring out more emotion. So in this case, you know, brighten her eyes up, that would be too much, so I back it down a little bit. Um, and even soften areas around her eyes a little bit more and do some of this retouching so that we have a little more emotion. Um, we can also, because we isolated her forehead from the rest of her facial mask, we can also smooth areas around her forehead just to give her overall more empathetic view. So now we can see what it looks like off and on. And like I said, we're not just applying this to a single frame, but we actually using that mask that was created using AI and applied it to the rest of the video playback as well. So this is basically accelerating a process that would have taken you many hours as a video editor and you can now do in a few seconds to change the appearance of this uh, film. I can turn that off and on if you want or pause and turn off and on just to kind of see the impact that that's making and then once again like playback. And there's many other like types of retouching that you can do as well. Um, they're continuously improving and creating more uh, effects. The last one that we can focus on is object removal. So in this case, we have a scene in our video that is very like iconic space scene. We have like the hope from the light here and then the bleakness of space here. The problem is we have this object and this object might not be part of the narrative later. It, it pre prevents us from reusing this later in our narrative. So what I can do is I masked out that object, basically just telling the computer where to look in this video, and then track this object um, across this video. So it's just tracking it, and then it can isolate that information, and I can add a node to remove it. So connecting that node to the previous one where I have my mask, and then adding object removal. Do that and then do scene analysis and this is using GPU acceleration to basically take this object and then infer what is behind it based on information in the rest of the scene. So now that we have that, we can then increase the search range slightly to be able to get rid of that and we have a new scene that we can use in our timeline. So once again, a process that would take many hours to do can now be done in a few moments uh, with the power of AI and GPU acceleration. Okay. Any questions about that one? No. No? Okay. Uh, lastly, we have uh, use, utilizing AI to synthesize new images. So this is like a pure example of uh, utilizing AI. What we did was we took millions of landscape images and we fed it to a um, generative adversarial network, which means we gave it to two supercomputers, then told them what grass was within those images, what rocks were, we only had to train a few images and provide this information, and then those two computers would then verify with each other what was a tree in the scene, what was sand in the scene, what was snow in the scene. After that process, they create a network. A network then can be run on an individual PC like this, once again accelerated using dedicated hardware, the tensor cores in our GPUs, so that now we can create new images based on the information that those computers uh, were trained on. So for example, if I want to create a 
grass scene here. I can do that if I wanted to add a water element here. You can see very quickly that we're starting to generate new images. If I want to, you know, add a mountain, I can do so. And then, for example, if I wanted to replace this water in the scene with more water, it will create a reflection based on the knowledge of the network of images that a reflection is needed when you have water near a background uh, characteristic. And then I can very quickly add things like sand to this in order to make like a beach area. And it will start generating waves in the sand um, to, to more naturally match what it saw in those network of images that we gave it. So these waves and these effects are being generated in real time. There are no images stored on this computer. We are generating new images based on AI information that has learned about landscapes. So yeah, you're free to, to play around with it and create your own images. This is, yeah, of course. Um, this is designed to help uh, people ideate very quickly, right? Like you can think, and now you can create as fast as you can think. And that's the idea uh, behind this whole uh, at the speed of imagination. So, yeah, thank you very much, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs>这种呢这种起伏嘛像那起伏嘛自然逻辑是吗不能太夸张行吧夸张就成涂抹吗我觉得它这种应该用一支笔会好一点你收字很粗的对就是不太好做这种比较细的还是你像这个触摸精度也很低像不像一个那什么一个景点我不知道是哪的但是没这样的那么本次到伊雅的这个技术会议呢就到这里就结束了其实我自己最感兴趣的功能还是 看我能不能后面搞到一台来评测评测好这期节目就到这里我们下期再见拜拜